Hello and welcome to the Coaching Podcast, coaching for success in sport and business. Your host is Emma Doyle, the energy and high performance under pressure coach who is a world leader in unleashing human potential. Buckle up for this high octane session. Let them have it, coach. G'day, everybody, and welcome to the Coaching Podcast, Coach for Success in Sport and Business. My name is Emma Doyle, and I have the pleasure of interviewing Martin Parks today. Martin, we are at the PTR Symposium here in Palm Springs. It's beautiful. It's been a great week, hasn't it? It has. It's been an amazing weekend so yeah, far. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm super excited to talk about is your diverse background. Um, you've coached tennis at all levels. And I can't wait to take a deeper dive into that, ask you about what you're doing today and your vision for the future. So without further ado, we'll get straight into our regular questions. The first question is the Vegemite question. Um, I'd have to compare it to the British bit of Marmite. Um, I'm actually not a fan. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> doesn't sit well with me. Uh, in which case, can you follow up? and begin with a coaching moment that didn't go well and what might be a lesson? Yeah, um, a coaching experience was probably during my, my college coaching career. I've multiple different diversities careers, but the college coaching career where I really took a step in a new position, got elevated into a new opportunity, and really just the culture um, was not that somewhere where I could thrive. I really felt uh, that I wasn't able to be the best version of myself in that managerial relationship. And, and sadly, I had to reposition myself into a, another career uh, in order to try and get away from that culture. But it ended up being that the culture then became better after I left uh, because of, you know, I, I got myself out of that toxic environment. Mm. So what's the lesson for people listening going, oh, something's not right in this environment? What's your... What would you? You've got to listen to your gut. Um, I listened to my gut. I really felt, and actually, it was a mutual kind of decision for us to separate ways uh, or, or, and go in different career directions because we just felt there was no future in that. And I, that was the best decision. It was a hard decision uh, because I was very loyal and really want to give everything to that program. But I really feel like, in hindsight, it was the best thing is just trusting my gut, making the decision to kind of move away from it, and yeah, everything now is where it is. So I'm happy. Yeah, fantastic. What about on the flip side, a moment that has gone really well and what might be a lesson? Um, fortunate, I've been fortunate with all the diversity. I've had, I've had multiple things. It's hard to depict uh, one specific element, but I suppose um, coaching in, 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 I guess in a, in a college team um, after my academy time, uh, I had the pleasure of coaching a team up from basically nothing up into a national final. And uh, just going through that journey of, of taking a team from nothing to a national final number one in the country. And uh, although we lost in the NCAA final, that was, uh, I still have nightmares about that experience, but it was a unbelievable journey. And the relationships I built through that experience has been lifetime. And I, it's been a stepping stone for, for future you know, growth mm. and, and, and learning. So, mm. And can you give us one of your, what was one of the secret sources to be able to make that happen? Good, great question. Again, culture, it goes back to culture and great, the environment that we created. Um, also, I was able that the the man the system that we had with the leadership in the the relationship I had with the coaching team and the the environment the culture we were able to create around that really allowed the team to thrive. I had great relations with some of the players before I brought them in and recruited them. Um, but we really had one specific thing that I kind of preached on a daily basis was let's learn from our successes and build on them. So it was something that resonated not just on the court but off the court. And it really kind of embodied our culture and also allowed us to apply things on the court in moments that really helped us get an edge against, you know, some of the best teams in the country. We we had that edge, you know, by having that kind of philosophy in, embedded in our culture. There's a lot to be said about building on strengths. Uh, Darren Cahill was one of our previous guests and he's question on for the podcast was how much time do you spend on working on your strengths and how much time do you spend on working on your areas for development so I love in your story about focusing on strengths and the importance of focusing on strengths um because we always say you know you either win or, or you learn, right? But when you win, you also learn. <laughs> so uh, thank you for sharing that. What about a sliding doors moment in your life? So I had the pleasure. Johnny Marry, um, he's a British touring professional, retired now. That was one of my closest friends growing up. We grew up together. And I had a, a moment here where I came early on his team uh, just to kind of help. He was in a career struggle. 
Um, but I remember just doing, um, as an applied sports psychologist, I did this performance profile. It was really just an accountability tool to find out where he is in his game, where he is in his mindset. And I remember doing the profile with him and we did two profiles. I did one for him and he did one for himself. And I remember significantly in that, that when I asked him to kind of tell him what his, what his strengths were, what his weaknesses were, he was able to list off everything that he did poorly. And only three things that he put on his list that he did well. I did the same profile because I grew up with him playing tennis. I played him as my doubles partner. We grew up playing. I played him six times in competition. And I did the same thing. And I wrote seven things that he did well, maybe four things that were areas of improvement that he, he could improve on. We compared the profiles and then putting those profiles together, we agreed on everything that we'd written about each other. And then it was just getting his mindset to think about, well, what do I need to do well? So we restructured his whole structure of his coaching and his day-to-day practices on building on what he does well, not working on his weaknesses. And that signified, I think, a little mental switch with him that later got him back into a, a career high uh, singles ranking or close to it before he got injured. And then he had a, a great career in doubles, but I was super fortunate to, to be involved in someone as great as Johnny Mary's career, uh, just having that significant moment. But that was a eye-opening moment for me and for him of just reshaping the lens of how he saw himself in his professional career. And so that was a, a moment that I will cherish and really feel like was empowering for both myself and Jonathan and in his career. I think he just verified that learning from your success is when players and in, in general or people in general can focus on their strengths and focus on what they do well, because in a day you're going to develop your career is going to be determined of what you do well. You're not going to thrive if you're focusing on your weaknesses or, or, or trying to channel your energies based on what you don't do well. In one to a maximum of three words, what do you think makes a great coach? I talked about this the other day. I was the pleasure of attending one of your courses, but um, I, I keep hitting on this idea of empathetic listener. Mm. I think communication and the ability to sit back and absorb and sponge listening to what your your, your player says. So just empathetic listener. Mm. I love the simplicity of that. Can we break down what does empathy mean to you? As a coach, one of the key factors, I believe, is making your player believe that you care about them more than just as a player or as an athlete, than as a human being. If you can make that relationship and make them understand that you care about them as a human being, tennis to me is just a tool that you really can communicate on a high level. Because once you get that trust, the, the listening becomes more clearer and the communication becomes more authentic. And then you can really figure out the, the root causes and then apply the action plan behind those root causes. And did that come naturally to you? Or did I, you have to learn that skill? I think a bit of both. Um, I think I was always told to go into this career when I was growing up. I was known as the comeback kid. I was very resilient. I was, even Johnny would describe me as like as a guy they could never beat, you know, because I was just, I was relentless. I had such a drive. And so I had this mental fortitude that within me, and so people told me to go into this career, which was a, a blessing that I'm following my passion, but also then just being around the best people in the world. I've learned from the best in the world so much diversity to my career. I've been sponged off all the best people in the world. So I've learned so much from the greatest that I've, I've taken that on board and applied it as mm. best I can in my own words, in my own way. Mm. I, I know you and I both admire Alistair McCoy. He's been yeah. a previous guest on the podcast. Is when you just think about him is there one gold nugget that he's um shared with you that that you could pass on yeah one nugget that i got from alistair and i, I had a presentation when i brought him to pepperdine university we had a little mental skills um with some of our teams at the at the university i was super privileged to have him there and i asked him a question i said alistair tell me what it is that you got out of your greatest failure i said you know tell me something you know your greatest failure give me some feedback i wanted to get that that answer him of being a pretty resilient guy himself and everything that he's gone through in his personal journey. And his answer just blew me away. He's like, I fail every day. Failure is just part of success. And that was like, Ooh, and that, that clicked with me. And I, I've told that to Alice a bunch of times, but um, yeah, it was, it was significant that failure is just part of success. And I think some of the greatest leaders, the greatest, most successful people, and I don't think our modern day society really clicks with how failure is a necessary process to succeed. It's not always enjoyable, is it? No, it's it's not. Mm. So we, I think we avoid it. But yeah, yep, absolutely. It's better to stay in the comfort zone. But not coaches listening to this podcast. <laughs> that growth mindset. All right. Yes. Our final official question is where we ask you to ask us a question. I would say, how important is it in your your skill suit to be adjustable, to be adaptable? Like, are you still in your own world? Are you doing the things necessary to keep learning and growing? Because 
the truth it is I have a lot of diversity to my experience. And I think in someone in my case where I've learned so much, it's it's a great strength of mine, but it's also a vulnerability because it's very hard to limit. So my, my question is, is are you focusing your energy in the areas that you're greatest at? Be careful not to spread, spread. yourself too thin. So my, my thing is, are you focusing on less in order to achieve more? Mm-hmm. Is the question Fantastic I have for you. Fantastic question for us to all focus on. I struggle with that throughout my career. We all do. Uh, yeah, we all do. So if you're listening to this and you're struggling uh, with being able to focus on that one thing, uh, sometimes just pick a lane is a really good tip as well. Yeah, go somewhere, and when you fail, which you will, fail quickly, and then and then keep keep moving forward is is really important. Uh, all right, so let's talk about resiliency. Let's go back, um, rewind the clock. Obviously, tell us a little bit about your backstory and some of the the multiple challenges that you had we spoke off air about uh visas and yeah. and you know you said you, you were a dogged competitor so how did that with your backstory translate into some of the challenges that you had with your career yeah, um could you share that yeah happy to and it, it's humbling it's a little uh yeah it does get me a little emotional but uh, as a 12 year old boy i followed a dream to have a career in tennis um i had a mentor who was american and a british professional tennis player I had no money, didn't come from very much, grew up very humble, um, you know, middle class to low class kind of, you know, standards yeah. uh, in Yorkshire, England. Yeah. yeah. So in West Yorkshire. Um, so I would, yeah, I started humble beginnings, but I had this dream that I wanted to follow. And I was super fortunate through my pro- relationship with Gary Henderson, uh, my mentor, that he, I gave me opportunities to, to go and be on the tour with him and just follow him around. But I followed that dream, but obviously when I came to, my dream was to come to America, to have that career, to have that vision, I end up coming, but my my dream was kind of shattered a little bit because I, I came, was made, worked hard, made all this money, and it was shattered by, at 21 years old, I came on my first visa, and, and the, the college experience was a disaster because the coach lied to me about scholarship, program got discontinued, so I had a horror story about that, but ultimately that trajectory me to continue to follow that dream shows some resiliency. So losing a scholarship, losing my place in a, in a college, my American dream about having his career continue was, was thrown away. And within six, like four weeks over the Christmas period, I had to transfer universities, find a new school and continue my journey. And I'd lost all my money because the coach had lied to me about everything. So I guess that started the journey where, as in that was in 2000. And when I came to that and I was 20, 21 years old, they overcame that. Finally, got myself into a university in North Carolina and started my college coaching career. Uh, started my tennis career there. Had a wonderful three and a half, seven semesters, eight, uh, four years at their university. But it projected me to then stay in Florida to be the Saddlebrook Tennis Academy, um, to go to then into that into college coaching to work with some pros, and then now into Pepperdine University to continue that. And now I have my own freelance high performance business. So all that started. But the, the summary of it is. For me to get where I am now, it took 17 years, 14 different visas, four immigration lawyers, and $50,000 of all my own money to, to sustain that, doing it the right way. So I've done everything by the book, and that is what I want to kind of now go, because I, I was awarded in 20, uh, 2017 my EB1 green card through my career highlights and everything I'd contributed to the career. So I'm super fortunate that the the U.S. government allowed me to to now be here and 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 fulfill in that dream because I've done everything by the book. But going through those years of setbacks um, and that initial experience of just having my call my American dream shattered, but then finding that resiliency to come back, and I've done that many many times over my career, losing jobs. Uh, NCA finals, I made the NCA finals. I I had a pay cut, and uh, they wouldn't sponsor my visa. So being an NCA finalist and being an, and taking a team for the first time, and then I, I lost my job pretty much. So that's another example. So it's just been a consistent roller coaster of adversities, but I wouldn't be here I, where I am today if it wasn't for those experiences and how that repositioned me under adversity to, to grow and become a better version of myself. Were there times at night or in the morning where you were like, this is too hard? Yes and no. Uh, I think everyone that's gone through that level of experience has doubts and has moments that if they, I'm, I'm, I've, I've suffered a little bit of depression in my, in my, that's nothing, nothing I'm afraid of. And that's, that's helped me, but there's definitely moments where I've really 
felt that I've been challenged, but at the same time, that I see challenge as an opportunity. I have had so many of these adverse situations that has put me in situations where I really had to work harder and really had to grow through those experiences and find success. So I've never had the easy pathway and I'm grateful for that. So you have a background in, in psych. Yeah, exactly. applied sports psychology. Correct. Yeah. Yep. With regards to developing a player, what's your thoughts around, obviously we've got the four pillars of technique, yeah. tactic, physical men- mindset. How much importance do you play on the the mindset as it relates to those four pillars? I mean, I think they're all encompassing. I think they all work together uh, hand in hand, but I think you have to, uh, person specific, you have to be able to know who that player is. Obviously, it's a very generalized question based on, well, who is the player? What is their needs? Are they a 12-year-old player that's journey, you know, uh, growing and, and new to the game? Uh, are they, uh, are they um, uh, you know, a high-level player that's got some competitive experience that's looking to go to college, or are they currently on the tour? So it's really, you have to always make it player-specific or person-specific mm-hmm. to what their needs are. But really, I'll, I'll take the point of, like, listening first, figuring out, I'll talk to people that know them well, try and understand their team, and then it will be relevant on what what are their specific needs based on what I learned from them. So I'll, I'll come from that listening standpoint mm-hmm. first, and then I'll recognize, well, and then I'll, through discussion, not through me telling them, it's like, well, what do you feel is is the best approach? Where do we feel we need to focus our energy and time? And then I'll just, through the experience I've had, kind of figure out what makes the most sense to, 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 to focus on what area. Okay, so what about a player at the highest level that you've had experience with uh, at that, you know, the, the peak end of high performance? Yeah. When If you can think of a player like that, What's been one of your uh, biggest go-to mindset strategies that you can uh, share? Yeah, I, I love this. Good. I've got a good example here. So I'm very fortunate. Um, the gentleman, Sebastian Fanenslau, is a, a German player, and he was struggling in his professional career, um, especially he hadn't got many results on the, on the European clay. He was more of a hardcore player. But I remember speaking to him, and the thing that stuck with him is Sebastian had intentions at that time during his career where he was dropped down a little bit to, to he wanted to be top 100 in the world as a pro player. And I said, Sebastian, so you, you're doing all these things, but are you going to wait until you're top 100 in the world until you start acting like it? And it was like a light bulb moment where he's like, well, good point. He said, are you doing the things that the top 100 players in the world are doing right now? Do you have a team around you? Are you doing the things that a top 100 player does? Because if you want to be a top 100 player, it takes those things. And so I think it was kind of at a moment where he then recognized what he needed, what resources he needed to bring in, how he needed to adjust his mindset in order to be able to take his career back in the right direction. So it it did go back in the right direction, had a lot of success, but he was struggling not knowing what it was, but he wasn't acting or living each day in a way that was consistent with what he wanted to achieve. So what is your current day-to-day look like and what's your vision? I was currently, I was in Florida for many years. I think a lot of people know me from my Saddlebrook days or my St. Leo University days. But yeah, now um, based uh, in kind of the Calabasas, Malibu area, but I've just stepped away from a recent role. So I'm actually looking to become an author. Um, I'm about to launch a a website. Um, So high five. Yes. Uh, So my my book that I'm spending all time on it, and it's anyone that's trying to write a book, it's a it's a good challenge, but hopefully my resiliency will will kick in. But um, yeah, the book is titled is Love 40 Making Better Lives Through Tennis. So I'm just trying to focus my main attention on the book and the website so then I can give back. Um, and so right now I'm just a high performance freelance coach, um, really just running my own side business with some touring professionals. I have a couple of players that I'm working with, but really I'm kind of an open book trying to you know, make things work in my own pro- uh, direction, entrepreneurship. Yeah. Um, so I'm learning in the last uh, eight months the the pros and cons of, of that world. So, yeah. And what, what, why Love 40 is the title? Uh, well, you may have to read the book for that. But no, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a jewel. I actually was writing on that, on that specifically, actually, last night. It's funny you mentioned it. Um, Love 40 is a dual meaning. Um, mm-hmm. Love 40 basically is the scoring of tennis, 0 40. So, I'm embodying a thing is that's ultimately a big challenge, 0 40 in a, in a game of tennis is you're not looking so hot, but I truly believe that to win a tennis match or to be successful in his career, you have to see love 40 as an opportunity. 
Um, and to see as a challenge, because if you can win a game from love 40 or 15, 40 in a match, it will guarantee that you're likely to win because the moment you can win a, a match from love 40 down, it sends a message to you and your opponent that, Hey, I ain't going away. So if I can win a love 40, the confidence I can build from that situation. So it's just the mindset in that moment of the scoring. And the other part of it is love 40. I, I met my, uh, my wife, um, and got married at 40 and the, the tennis was the reason here. So love came for me at 40 years old and Whoa. you know so a little bit of that tie in as well that's fantastic and i have always uh found this to be super interesting for all the tennis audience people out there when you are advantage down in a game you have to win three points in a row to win the game which when you love 40 down again to get back to juice you have to win three points in a row and not many people Think about that because yeah. when you're only advantage down, they think, oh, you know, no worries. Yeah. But love 40, oh, it's such a, it's such a big nice gap. mountain. And then the other thing, when you said love 40, there's also the reverse psychology is, is you could be the returner. Yes. So then you've got a whole, you know, that opportunity to break, yeah. to break. So great title. Basically, Martin Parks Tennis is the website. Dot yeah, com. dot com. Yeah. Perfect. I thought dot.co.uk yeah. or dot .com.au. Or, or, this actually could be, could be all of the above. Yes, yes, all of the above. <laughs> Rounding off this episode, two questions. The first one is what has impacted you uh, at this symposium? Um, so that's the first one that I, you know. It's, well, apart from meeting what, yourself. <laughs> <laughs> apart from this wonderful, wonderful opportunity, I'm all about strike while the iron is hot. Martin comes up and says, I'd love to be on your podcast. I was like, well, let's let's do it in the next yeah. day or two. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, you know, it's so nice to be in person as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always on the, doing my interviews on the back up on the other side of a screen. But, yeah, is there something that's a little, something that's come up that you're like, I'm really going to take that? I'm, I'm, I think what it just reinforces is that how important it is to be at these types of events. Obviously, I'm here to network and, and meet people and just think, surround myself. I truly believe that you can't be the best version of yourself unless you surround yourself with the right people. So I'm really here. I picked up some great triggers, some great pick, uh, bullet points from so many great people. And a lot of it is just the reinforcement of things maybe I know and just said a different way. So I can't, this is too big a list of things that I've, I've learned, but every single speaker I've really enjoyed listening to and I've really taken what they've taken in a very simple one or two bullet points so get get more involved in these events because you just learn so much and you meet so many good people and it, it really helps you just to be a better version of yourself moving forward and finally yeah my last question is what's your dream oh good dream uh, is to finish the book <laughs> and to really let the book be a catalyst for me sharing my experiences giving back to the tennis world which the sport of tennis which i, I just see as a tool for my for my journey um and, and really just give back you know uh, the experiences i've had and, and hope that i can make a positive impact obviously you know there's a there's a health crisis that i see in the world and, and if the book can have a one percent influence on just being a resource to helping people see a tool like tennis as an example um or a sport you know help them positively grow and, and that holistic growth I'm just, uh, I'll be super happy. An absolute pleasure having Martin on the show. It's been great to get to know you and I love your energy. I love what you're about. So, uh, yeah, thanks for this spontaneous opportunity to interview you. Anytime. Thank you for your time. The Coaching Podcast is sponsored by Transition Coach for Athletes, a global coaching, mentoring, and U.S. placement service. The service helps athletes navigate the often challenging world of choosing your best college fitness performance. Visit www.transitioncoachforathletes.com. That's the number four.